Good evening, my name is Dr. Jason Wingard, Dean of the School of Professional Studies. I am very excited here to welcome two special guests. We have Dr. Gayatri Devi and we have Ms. Gloria Steinem, two stalwarts, two women entrepreneurs, lecturers, writers, political advocates, um, entrepreneurial experts, uh, social activists. Uh, we are very pleased today to speak with both of them on the topic of leadership. Uh, we're very pleased to speak with you. Thank you very much for being here. Leadership development is a topic that I am very interested in. Our school's mission is grounded in preparing students, preparing managers, preparing professionals for keeping pace with the changing dynamic of the workplace. It's constantly changing. It's changing more rapidly now than ever before. And we want to make sure that our students are prepared to meet the employer's needs and demands. And so preparing men and women for those challenges is part of our mission. We want to talk to you today because you both are very steeped in interdisciplinary thought leadership. You have lots of insights to share with us. And so what I would like is to ask you a few questions about how you have come to be as successful and impactful and influential as you have been. Um, Gloria, um, Gayatri has mentioned that she considers you a mentor, uh, as so many men and women around the world do, for all the work that you have accomplished and the impact that you have had on society. What would you say are some of the basic tenets of being a good mentor and likewise being a good mentee? Mm. I'm not sure that I feel like a mentor. I feel like a colleague. I feel like we learn from each other, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, uh, in an odd way, the most important qualification for being a mentor or a mentee is the same thing, listening. Mm. Because you allow someone to know that they have something to say because you listen to them. That's how we know as children, you know, that's how we know as grown-ups that we have something to say. And it is also true, uh, you know, for, for knowing what it is that that particular person needs to become a leader. You need to understand who that unique person is. Mm -hmm. Gayatri, we know that 51% of the managers in the United States are women, but far fewer women advance to the C-suite. And so when you look at other key indicators, such as the US Census Bureau, it shows that the gender pay gap is also pretty broad and wide, and that on average, 21, 22% of women managers in the same role, um, they make less uh, than their male counterparts. So um, you know, a man makes 21% more than a woman in the same role here in the United States. So on the one hand, we have a lot of women who would advance to the management role, but they haven't advanced to the C-suite. On the other hand, when they are in those management roles or in the C-suite, they make considerably less uh, than their male counterparts. Uh, my question would be to you, what is it that managers in general need to do? What kinds of policy needs to be set by boards of directors and trustees to be able to minimize or eradicate even, you know, that gender pay gap? Um, so I think that goes back to the earlier question about mentorship. Um, and I think one of the best things women can do, and um, this is what I did when I was president of the American Medical Women's Association too, is to tell people, women particularly, that you have to ask. You have to ask to be paid what you're worth. And you have to ask for the position that you think you are able and qualified to fill. And, you, and the best way to do it, really, is to find mentors who are going to teach you how to do that. And I think I've been very privileged in that regard because I've had so many mentors over the course of my life. Gloria, I know you don't think you are, but you are very much a mentor. And for a bunch of reasons, I think because you listen well, you don't judge. Um, you um, are always supportive. And it doesn't matter what crazy idea I come up with. 
you always say, well, you know, that's a good idea, and maybe there's another way to do this. So I think finding good mentors is crucial for women to be able to succeed. I mean, my practice is based on the fact that I found a mentor, a woman that I was speaking, I saw give a talk, um, and I went up to her after the talk, and I said, I love how you gave that talk. And she said to me, come see me afterward. Turned out she was a professor of medicine at Columbia, Marianne Legato, and she, she taught me everything I know about how to run a practice. Um, and she said to me, this is how you're going to run your practice, and don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Mm. Um, and I don't think I'd have had the courage to do what I did if it wasn't for a very fierce mentor like her in that regard. So I think for women, you've got to find good mentors, and it doesn't have to be just women, it could be women or men, mm -hmm. and um, they can teach you how to value yourself. Yeah. yeah. So I'll piggyback on that comment. Gloria, you have been a mentor to me as well. So you can be a mentor it to both out men very well. and women. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your leadership. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I would say that you know, your writings, your teaching, uh, the result and impact that your political activis activism has had on society has been truly influential and inspiring to me. As a male leader, as a male manager, I think about the work that you've done and how I manage you know, our team and, and our school. So I'll ask you the same question. Um, you've, you've spoken about this and written a lot about it, but what are your insights on how we close the gender pay gap for women, you know, we've made so many advances in women getting to the point where they have the management jobs, but they're not making the same amount of money and they're not advancing further. And so what is your advice on how we can finally tackle this? We, we could use some better laws. I mean, it ought to be and is becoming against the law to ask you what your salary was before you took this job, mm -hmm. because the point is your qualifications. And you know, that is beginning to change. Uh, so it's all the way from legal changes to, um, under, to treating children as a natural part of life for both men and women so mm -hmm. that we stop the practice of when men have children, they're more likely to be hired, and when women have children, they're less likely to be hired because it's assumed that they will be distracted, but the men, you know, we have to equalize all of that. And, and some of it is internal. You know, I mean, we... As, as, as women especially, and I think any outside groups, you might say, tend to, to measure ourselves against the ideal. Oh, the person who occupies this job should be, and am I the ideal? Don't measure yourself against the ideal. Measure yourself against Harry, who now has the job. Mm, it's yeah. a totally different standard, right? That's right, that's right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It helps. It does. So, Gayatri, when, re when researching your book, The Spectrum of Hope, the new book, um, I came across a lot of reviews, uh, very positive, uh, very strong reviews, so congratulations on that. But there were particular words that were used to describe your style um, and the way in which you testify to the experiences that you've had and the recommendations and advice you have. These words are compassionate, calming, caring, understanding, empowering, authentic. What were some of the experiences that you've had and influences professionally and personally that have helped to shape this tone and, and the approachability that you have both as an author as a, and as a practitioner? So, um, you know, I started, I graduated very young from school and uh, my goal in life was to look and behave old. So I remember when I was first an assistant professor here at Columbia, I would wear um, glasses even though I didn't need them and I would wear a jacket <laughs> and I would always be very stiff and formal and I am by nature somebody who is not that way um, and I felt I couldn't really relate much to my patients because I was putting myself into this mold of who I think thought I should be um, and then I decided you know I can't be real with my patients if I'm not real with myself there are certain clothes I like to wear. There are certain boots I like to wear. <laughs> and I thought, I can wear this and still be a fairly good doctor. And I remember the turning point came maybe about 
15 years ago, I was out east on the beach and I got a call from a very staid, very proper patient. And they said that they were very ill and they needed to see me right away. And I was inappropriately dressed, to say the least. And I showed up at their home and I took care of them and it didn't matter how I looked. What mattered was the knowledge I was able to use to help them in that moment. Mm. And in that moment, I realized, you know what? Being a doctor and being able to connect with your patient has to do with the exchange of certain, a certain attitude and a certain state of mind. It had nothing to do with mm -hmm. the persona you're trying to create. And it was tremendously freeing. And I think that's probably what made me fairly seen as approachable because I was approachable to myself. I was honest to myself. I was authentic to myself. And I think people like Gloria, people like Dr. Legato, made, made it okay for me to be that way. And they never said to me, oh my God, I can't, I can't believe you showed up like that. They just said, oh, that's fine. It's all right. Um, so I think mentorship is key in this, in it, to become a leader, um, to find the right people who are not going to, who are going to see you for who you are. Mm -hmm. so, so Gloria, picking up on that same theme mm -hmm. of mentorship and um, the need for it, we have a program here at the School of Professional Studies. It's called the Columbia Girls in STEM Initiative. This program is focused on supporting uh, primarily young women who are coming from underserved communities and being able to expose them to mentors, to fields of study in the science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines so that they can become aware of what's available to them and to be able to get some of the support along the way so that they can advance into these careers where historically they are not. What advice would you give to those young women, will you give when you come to visit those young women, uh, about how they can leverage the mentorship that is available to them and use it for good mm -hmm. and use it for their own advancement? Well, you're already doing the first most important thing, which is giving each of them a mentor I mean, as they say, you have to see it to be it, you know? Yeah. So each young woman hopefully has somebody who she can identify and looks like her and, you know, okay, you know, she can kind of imagine it. And I would say the next step is that when she goes out into the work world, she needs to have at least once a week a group of people who are involved somehow in the same endeavor. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it, it, they just somebody they can be quite diverse but they have some share some of the same ambitions we are communal animals and when we're by ourselves or even there are only two of us you know we start to feel wrong or cast aside or something and there's a reason why every social justice movement in the world has come out of people sitting down Somebody says the thing that happened to them, they think it only happened to them. That's right. Six other people say, oh, that also happened to me. You discover that if the same thing is happening to unique human beings, it's political and you can do something about it. That, you know, we haven't been sitting around campfires for hundreds of thousands of years <laughs> for nothing. So I would just say to those young women, women to uh, make sure they have uh, small steady groups uh, to commune with in some way once they're in the workforce. Hmm. So what advice would you give to you know, a particular teenage girl who is 17 years old, who may or may not be my daughter, who is saying, <laughs> that is wonderful uh, that you do are... Do you have a 17-year-old I do have a 17-year-old <laughs> daughter. And uh, you'll be happy to know that her college essay for application to college featured some of your work and activities. She's very interested in social justice and human rights. So, and so uh, what would you say to, to my daughter about how she can, because you know, the essence of her essay was, I wanna be just like Miss Dynam and I wanna be able to do some of what she was able to do. Mm -hmm. And my question would be for her, because I asked her, what would you ask her if, if you were here tonight? And her question is, well, what do I need to do mm -hmm. to be ready to do what she did as a leader? Well, I would just say she's going to be something even more fantastic than being like me or anybody else. <laughs> she's going to be herself. Hmm. And if she 
does what she loves so much that she forgets what time it is when she, while she's doing it, that it's so interesting to her, you know, that uh, she gets excited by her own ideas about what this problem, how could that be solved, and how, you know, mm -hmm. and then finds people to support that. Then, you know, that's the key to everything. Because your daughter, like all of us, is the result of millennia upon millennia of, mm -hmm. of environment and heredity combined in a way that could never have happened before and could never happen again. That's right. And at the same time, we are all share all of humanity, right? That's right. That's right. But you know, pursuing that excitement and that uniqueness will give her joy as well as success. Oh, that's powerful. Oh, thank you. So Gayatri. Uh, moving on from the high school students to the graduate students. So you're a distinguished alumna of our Master of Science in Narrative Medicine, and there are many women who will come after you in the program looking to do something similar uh, to what you have been able to achieve in the field of medicine and, and research. What advice would you have for the women who are at Columbia studying in the program of Narrative Medicine or bioethics, or technology management, or actuarial science, who want to take their degree, which has been very carefully tailored for their needs and for what the market is looking for, and be able to put their own entrepreneurial spin on it and to become leaders like you have been. What advice do you have for them? Um, I think what I've noticed with women is that they don't promote themselves. Hmm. And they really ought to. And it's, it's, it doesn't sit well a lot with women, um, and they should do it consistently and often. They should truly believe in themselves. And if you don't believe in yourself, behave like you do. And um, if not, find mentors who will help you believe in yourself. Um, so I think those are two, and, and to really ask, ask for what, you think a male colleague would be asking for, for in that same position. And if you're not sure, research it. I mean, even though there are more women physicians now than there ever were before, the gap between male and female physicians is getting, in terms of pay scale, is getting larger, not smaller. And that's because women are afraid to negotiate. They're afraid that if they negotiate and ask for a better salary, they're going to be less liked. And Liking has nothing to do with, you know, it's, you've got to separate the two and understand you can ask and the worst they would say is no, yeah. Have you had the ability to learn that on the job? Is that part of your own personality that you were blessed with that you could do that from the beginning? How have you been able to navigate that? So I had a mom who was very strong in my family my, both my grandmothers were very strong. Um, when I was in high school, there was a biology teacher called Miss Lily who said to me, she said, Gayatri, just ask, what's the worst they would say? No. And in fact, I was remembering her as I just said this. <laughs> um, and then subsequently, I've had a lot of people who have said to me that if you want something, you first have to ask for it. And I think that's something that women don't do as much. You know, they complain sometimes. They're afraid to ask, but you have to ask, and you have to keep asking, mm -hmm. um, and ask as many people as you can. Especially okay. when you're already prepared. Especially right? when you're already prepared, and I think, you know, I was very well prepared doing the narrative medicine program here. It was very helpful. Too. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Well, we're proud of what you've been able to do. So, Gloria, a uh, last question for you. Um, much of what you've talked about through your career has been in support of the advancement of women. Uh, across a variety of fields, uh, and uh, your impact, as we've talked about earlier, has been tremendous. One of the aspects that, which, which I spoke about earlier, which has been really helpful to me, is the advice you've given to men about how to advance women. So, can you give us a summary of some of what you expect men to be doing now in today's society and today's market economy to help close the gender pay gap that we spoke of earlier? to be better mentors to women, to be better sponsors of women. What should men be doing mm. that you don't see men doing right now? 
Well, I think we should all be naming unfairness whenever we see it. Mm -hmm. You know, so if men are in a group that's all male, they can say, where's the other half of the human race? You know, there's something wrong here. You know, <laughs> they're condescending to me. You know, so <laughs> if, if everybody is all white or all, I don't know. I mean, we can just name it. We can ask each other what we make. You know, it's the one thing we actually know. You know, we know our salaries. We don't usually share our salaries. But I, I would say at the most fundamental and long term, the most important thing that men can do is raise children as much as women do. Or raise their sons to raise children, whether they're going to have kids or not. I mean, I don't have children, but I was raised to raise children. So I was raised to have the qualities necessary to raise children, to be empathetic, to pay attention to detail, be patient, all those things. Right. Those qualities are called feminine, but they're not. They're human. Mm -hmm. And men become whole people. Boys become whole people. When they are raised in that way, and girls could become whole people when they are raised with you know sports and being in the world outside the home. It's not rocket science. It's... <laughs> it's it's, it's shared humanity. And I, 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 I really think it's what we need to do is stop thinking about women's problems over here in a silo and understand it's fundamental to everything. Because the invention of gender roles, which is gender is invented, race is invented, deep, you know, we can't mistake how deep it goes, but it's also an invention. And it, it comes from societies relatively recently in human history, uh, especially here on Manhattan Island, where we are, <laughs> that, that said, okay, men are going to control reproduction, and therefore the bodies of women. And so we got these masculine, feminine roles, which are ridiculous. You know, they're depriving everybody. They're shortening men's lives, mm -hmm. you know, by five years, we once figured out. The masculine role is killing men. Uh, who else has you five extra years of life to offer you? you know? <laughs> um, but it really is about developing, I mean, thinking of the full circle of, of human qualities. So the most reliable ally, I think, is somebody who's doing it for enlightened self-interest. Mm -hmm. So men who are Yes, they're doing it for women, and they're doing it because it's just and right. Yes, but they're also doing it for themselves in a deep way. Yeah. So Gayatri, your time here at Columbia as a master's student in the narrative medicine program afforded you lots of opportunities and experiences um, that you've been able to use to advance in your career very successfully. What is one thing, as you reflect on your experience here at Columbia, what is one thing that you remember as particularly preparing you well for uh, in your profession? Well, so I um, came to the program a little bit differently. You know, I came, I was already fairly established in my profession. I wanted to add a facet to what I was practicing that I was lacking, I thought. Um, I wanted to have a better sense of being able to describe my patients in a human way, uh, which I felt, but I felt that I wanted to be able to translate that and make patients persons first with illnesses, which is kind of how I approach them, but to be able to convey that. And I think that's something I learned from being here in the narrative medicine program. Okay, good. So Dr. Gayatri Devi and Ms. Gloria Steinem, thank you very much, both of you, for spending some time with me today to talk about your careers, your writings, your teaching, your social and political activism in society. Uh, thank you for talking about mentorship and sponsorship and overall about leadership and how we can advance managers, particularly female managers, uh, in the workplace here in uh, in society in America. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> you guys did well. I forgot you guys were We get into this. Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah. Can we, can we hold for one second? We just want to get. I was saying to. The, the to, tone, the 
all this traffic. To Gayatri, that, that the in Indian country here, and probably in old cultures, other old cultures too, if you're sick, they say you've lost your story. Yeah. Or song, sometimes they say you've or lost song. your song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can everybody be quiet for, we need 10 seconds. Oh. 10 seconds of this room. Ready? Or bus tone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Got a lot of